Okay, now I want to turn attention to um, uh, our friends at Lion Rock, who have been our co-hosts throughout the, the day, and um, and we're asking Andrew Shun, who's one of the co-founders of Lion Rock, to enlighten us a little bit about the situation here in Hong Kong. You know, we, we all sort of descended upon the city uh, during MPS at a very interesting time in its history, and uh, we thought it would be uh, a missed opportunity if we didn't ask uh, Andrew uh, to, to share some thoughts about uh, what to expect in the future of this uh, uh, of, of Hong Kong, which has been such a, uh, a beacon of the values that we all hold, and it's really an interesting crossroad. So, please welcome Andrew Shin. Uh, thank you for the kind of introduction. Uh, I've never actually given a speech to such a big crowd. This is an old crowd. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 it's usually it's usually stupid, uh, especially in English. Uh, but in, in Cantonese, in my native language, uh, I do I do do a lot of uh, presentation speeches. But so that my if my English kind of sucks tonight. Your mom can like your English. Um, well, welcome everyone to our home, Hong Kong. Um, this year marks actually 10th anniversary of the Lion Rock Institute, uh, which was set up with much technical assistance and financial assistance from the Atlas uh, Foundation. And we are very proud to be known for our association with Atlas. So, uh, first, gratitude to the Atlas Foundation. Um, uh, I was at the Mont Pelerin Society's uh, conference. Uh, my first time, because uh, uh, you know, I thought I've heard so much about it. Finally in Hong Kong, so I had to go. And uh, I remember sitting there the first day at lunch, listening to uh, President uh, Václav Klaus. And uh, in the first part of the speech, he basically took the MPS to the woodshed, right? Yes, right, absolutely. right. And uh, I was sitting there listening to him, and he goes, "You know, the MPS now is oh, I, 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 I can't do a check." But, um, but he was like, you know, all these things can type now. And when he said that, as one of the co-founders of the Lion Rock Institute, I looked up what was in the basement. But I looked up into the heavens and I thought, Anthony Fisher up there must be smiling when he said that. Because it was obviously a model that works. And therefore it's replicated all around the world. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, President Klaus, if you're watching this on YouTube, <laughs> but um, um, today I'm supposed to tell you about the future of Hong Kong. But before I proceed, I would like to remind you what is at stake here. It was the winter of 1996. I was 18, and because of disastrous public exam results, I had to take a year out to work for my local legislator. <laughs> And during the week of Chinese New Year, it was, yeah, you know, Chinese New Year, it was January, February, 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 I flew to Vancouver to visit my uncle, the immigrant. I spent a lot of time watching American TV. In fact, I discovered that in Canada, you can watch about American TV then. So I took the advantage to watch the, uh, the, the NBA All-Star Games, which had Michael Jordan on that time. But during the substantial amount of advertising that they aired, uh, I began channel surfing, and there I discovered an even more interesting context. It happened to be the 1996 U.S. presidential election primaries, and uh, all the drama was happening surrounding the Republican Party, because Bill Clinton was obviously the incumbent. And there was this man, this man named Steve Forbes. Despite the fact that he has never held any political office, he was leading the opinion polls. How? Well, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with Steve Forbes. I'm sure it's not because of his Obama-esque eloquence. <laughs> he is good, though. Um, it was because of his uh, simple repeating of the same message over and over again whenever a microphone or camera was in front of him. And what was that magical message that propelled him to help this man to the lead? We should have a flat tax like Hong Kong. We should have a flat tax like Hong Kong. We should have a flat tax, like Hong Kong. And there was this 18-year-old me sitting on the couch in, in Vancouver, thinking, well, oh, here's an American leading the opinion polls, who likes our taxes more than anyone in the history of Hong Kong, ever, <laughs> or since. 
And it was at that moment I realized what happened here in Hong Kong, how things are done here. It's not just a matter for the 0.1% of humanity that is here. That Hong Kong truly is that shining city upon a hill whose beacon light guides freedom, love, and people everywhere. So will this beacon light shine as brightly in the future? In order to predict the future, as a, as a former equity analyst and a common, a, a, a current uh, stock commentator, it is very hard, as I can say. But I would, first of all, go back to look at the past. Does the factors that led to free market policies in Hong Kong still remain? I would like to go all the way back to the 1840s, when the barren rock of Hong Kong was ceded to the British by the Chinese. Our first governor, Henry Pottinger, established three basic governing tenets that set the tone for this new crown colony. The first was Hong Kong to remain as free, which in those days meant free of custom duties. The second was anyone, including the enemies of the empire, can trade freely anything in Hong Kong. The third was respecting local customs, which in fact, which in effect gave high degrees of social freedom to the people of Hong Kong. All three's existence can be explained by the liberal thought super pervasive at that time in London. But without the approval of hard-nosed realists actually running the colony, those policies would have never been implemented. First, the reason for free trade is to make this colony one that would be profitable for the empire. Or for those who subscribe to public choice theory, profitable for the decision makers. Second, the reason to allow anyone, including the enemies of the British Empire, to trade freely is because it's very hard for Britain to defend Hong Kong geopolitically. The, uh, the current uh, site of the uh, government headquarters in Hong Kong is called Tamar. And Tamar is actually the name of the river that, uh, at the mouth of this particular river, back in Britain, uh, has the city of uh, Plymouth. Uh, the Americans were no Plymouth because that's where the Pilgrims set off. But for the people of Hong Kong, that is actually the home of the South China Sea uh, fleet. And that was their home base. And that was uh, why the, uh, the headquarters built upon the former British military base is now called Tamar. Uh, and on third, well, you want, you want the, uh, the enemies of the British Empire to be able to be here freely and also trade freely. Uh, it's because you want to reduce the incentives for the enemies of the Empire to actually invade here. And uh, according to legend, the British Foreign Office actually believed the Japanese would never attack Hong Kong. And they did. Uh, in fact, on the same day, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Um, but uh, the British actually left very few troops in Hong Kong, due to various reasons. But one of them was because they believed that the Japanese found value in Hong Kong and would never invade. Um, third, on respecting local customs. Well, this was a lesson, I'm sure, for all you, all you now Ferguson fans out there, uh, that uh, this lesson was learned in places like India, where massive civil unrest would result if such customs were not respected. I remember there was a uh, there was a commentator from America that once that once observed the British ran uh, India with fewer personnel that it took to say fill the uh, stadiums on my alma mater at University of Michigan, and in Hong Kong, uh, about ten years after the uh, founding of Hong Kong, the population of Hong Kong was about a hundred thousand, and there was only less than one thousand Europeans in Hong Kong, and the remaining were Indian, Malays, and of course Chinese. So uh, restricting local customs was a is an extremely important part of just simply maintaining control of this crown colony. Hong Kong's population and economy swelled with its wealth policies from less than half a million people at the end of the Second World War to 4.5 million in 1975. So I, I'm sure there is there is uh, a few special economic zonistas out there. In 30 years' time, the population grew nine times. My parents, and if you were here for Atlas, uh, Peter Wong's, our executive director's uh, presentation today, uh, all came during that period, either by swimming or sneaking in. A mainlander from China is able to successfully evade being caught upon entering city limits will be granted legal status, and hence will begin their integration into Hong Kong. In fact, our group is called the Lion Rock Institute, not only because of the economic miracle that happened at the foot of Lion Rock Mountain, but because the Lion Rock Mountain was also the previous demarcation of city limits. So once you made it past the Lion Rock Mountain into Kowloon, you'll be given legal status. 
So I see a similar uh, occurrence going on in America right now, where there is lots of uh, illegal migrants coming to the U.S. And if you were to apply the same policy in the U.S., you would set up an office in Omaha, Nebraska, <laughs> and tell everyone, we will do everything we can, including building a wall. We'll try to stop you, but if you make it into the city limits of Omaha, Nebraska, we'll give you a wake up. And trust me, this policy was called the touch base policy. And if you ask me, as the co-founder and the research director of the Lyle Rock Institute, if there is one policy that explains the economic miracle that is Hong Kong, I would say it was that. And the reason is because the policy's unintended consequence was it became a filter. As those, only those with cunning strength and a certain level of subversiveness made it. Qualities that were not only important to successful illegal migration, but also for enterprise. But in 1975, with the fall of Saigon, Vietnamese refugees, this was actually from George Stacey, he was always over there. Um, Vietnamese refugees began pouring into Hong Kong. And the Hong Kong government grew increasingly hostile to non Chinese migrants. And in 1980, the Hong Kong government itself ended the touch base policy. And uh, according to the, uh, to the uh, to, uh, previous uh, chief secretary of Hong Kong, which is kind of like the prime minister of Hong Kong, um, Anson Chan, she explained that the Hong Kong government had to end the touch base policy because predictably, in the 1970s, the Hong Kong government began to implement welfare policies. So. <laughs> and then in the early 1980s, the British decided to negotiate an arrangement for Hong Kong as 1997 was approaching. And 1997 is a special year because Hong Kong was actually ceded to the, uh, ceded to the British in three parcels. And the final last bit was actually not ceded in perpetuality. It was merely a 99-year lease signed by the Qing Dynasty. And in 1898, it was scheduled to end in 1997. So uh, that was when the British decided to go with we'll, we'll deal with this. And in hindsight, especially from 2014, I think the timing was extremely fortuitous. In fact, the call this period the golden window, as the Chinese was negotiating from relative weakness. China's economy was so weak by the 1970s, and I'm sure all of you know the percentage of G global GDP, etc., etc., that national implosion was a clear and pre present danger. We, a few million people out of a billion that they ruled, occupied substantial mindset. But they also recognized the qualities of what made Hong Kong must be kept for the strategic imperative of China, especially in boosting their economy. Also, as all Chinese leaders believed that the threat to the People's Republic lied in every corner, because that's what happened to us, but probably have experienced it too. The handover of Hong Kong was a must. Uh, legend has it that when Margaret Thatcher arrived in 1982 in Beijing, uh, she walked through many corridors in the forbidden city, and uh, doors after doors swung open, until the last one swung open, and that stood just two individuals, Deng Xiaoping and the Premier Zhao Ziyang with him. And the first thing Dan said was, welcome to Beijing, Madam Prime Minister. We're taking back Hong Kong, and he's here to negotiate the details with you. And Deng Xiaoping subsequently just left the room. So Margaret Thatcher panicked, and she walked out. She, she was like, i got to go back to my embassy to talk to my team. So she went outside, and uh, when she arrived to the, to the motorcade, the limousine motorcade, uh, she tripped, and she fell. And this was broadcasted all over Hong Kong television now. And, and the result? Well, the most uh, clear one was that it only took five Hong Kong dollars to buy one US dollar that day. And within two weeks, it went down to 10 Hong Kong dollars to one US dollar. And uh, it, there was a saying that they'd rather have toilet paper than uh, money paper at that, at that point. But um, I also call, look, I, I call this negotiation period the golden window. Because not only did it happen after China's opening, in 1978. I'm pretty sure that if we play the what if in history, if this negotiation was done, say, under a rich China, or was it, 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 it maybe was done when Mao was still in power, the outcome would have been very different. But um, it's a window which subsequently closed because it was also done before the Western world itself 
succumbed to the siren calls of increasing authoritarianism after 9-11. So therefore, it's kind of strange that Hong Kong is one of the few places left in the world that the law enforcement cannot hold you without charge for more than 48 hours. And the courts actually do make sure that that happens, that you are released if you're not charged. And it was certainly no surprise for me that an expert of covert surveillance, such as Edward Snowden, would choose Hong Kong as his first port of call. That was actually kind of more news for people in Hong Kong, because we thought that, you know, well, communism was all over us, and then suddenly this opera was unfolded right in front of us. But unfortunately, apart from this particular negotiation in this golden window, the trend of increasing interventionism continues. I mean, I'm being very harsh today about Hong Kong, because I know we're all, you know, believers. And I don't want to, I don't want to hide anything from you all. I mean, if you, if you were all sitting down here and you were all socialists, I would be, Hong Kong's the best. All this place, <laughs> helping us, everything about us. But uh, I'm taking Hong Kong to the woodshed now, because um, unfortunately, as things went along, there were ever increasing transfer payments, for example. Infrastructure investment that used to be solely reliant on private sector uh, became more and more government driven. Of course, without, uh, uh, with, with, with more safe data returns and whether anyone was actually going to use it. And then came 1997. Looking at the science, you would have thought our free market ways didn't change after 1997. The government, for example, allowed the largest investment bank based out of Saito, the largest Asian financial investment bank based out of Japan, to go bust in 1997. Um, another legend has it that uh, the chairman of the banking group, Perry, called up uh, C.H. Tong, our chief executive then, uh, one of the speakers actually, uh, two days ago, and uh, simply asked for a bailout. Or, you know, the bank is going to be bailout, not in the first step anyways. He merely asked for a guarantee. And then C.H. Tong basically said, Hong Kong is a free market economy, and swam down the phone. <laughs> so despite this popularity, I still defend him for, this, for, for that particular action to this day. Um, and in fact, because he failed to bail out this bank, uh, Hong Kong became one of the only major financial centers of the world, because I'm not going to call Tokyo or something, that didn't suffer a banking failure in 2008. Uh, our bankers actually think that Moody's and SMP is a complete joke. And I just wish more bankers shared the same sentiment. <laughs> And then we also lived through a property bubble bursting. And uh, this, I think, Bill will also vote me on this one. I think it is the only jurisdiction in the world in the last century, because I, I don't know if you did more research back, like, way back when. Right? But this is the only jurisdiction in the world that suffered through a massive property bust, but did not have any currency devaluation. We did it all solely through internal price revaluation, which is a far more precise and hence far more efficient way in the re reallocation of resources back into the economy. We also abolished an entire tax. And in fact, we said goodbye to the inheritance tax. And we privatized both not only in name, but actual control and financial ownership of nearly 10% of all retail spaces in Hong Kong that used to be controlled by the government. And we actually have the chairman of the uh, group, which now is the only company for all three of those But that was one of the cleanest, most pure privatizations in the history of privatizations. There was no golden vote. There was no retaining right by the government to control how those resources would, 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 would be uh, managed. And um, I think that was a not only a great policy from a uh, from a key market, group, but uh, with the influx of Chinese tourists. Uh, if those 10% of retail spaces wasn't liberated back into the, uh, into the marketplace, we would have even higher rents and even more, perhaps, uncompetitiveness when it comes to uh, our commercial rent. But however, in the post-1997 world, many things did fundamentally change. In the larger picture, especially the geopolitical, Hong Kong is no longer deemed indefensible militarily by our masters. London might not be able to defend us, but Beijing certainly could. The central government being ever mindful of Chinese history and its relations with foreign powers, and indeed ever looking at the disintegration of the Warsaw Pact and the subsequent color revolutions, looked at any chance of such occurrence in Hong Kong with the utmost caution. But the biggest threat to our freedom lies within, and I would call it the technician versus engineer problem. 
something that I teach all my interns, by the way. The difference between a technician and an engineer is this. <clears throat> you give a technician an iPhone, and he could use every function with the greatest efficiency. <laughs> but if you were to ask the same technician, why does Steve Jobs put the whole bucket there? He wouldn't know the reason. So they feel less restrained in changing what worked. And unfortunately, many of our policymakers are indeed technicians. For example, we might have had the courage to let an investment bank fail in 1997, but we blinked in 2008. And we provided a blanket guarantee to all the banks and their creditors, which I believe, and our entire institute, with all our pens, with all our colleagues, with all our show airtime, went out and warned that it laid the foundation to the next financial crisis. And on the importance of the rule of law, we or I will sell it to the, uh, to the you know, average business person. But the rule of law is when the Inland Revenue Services sends you a tax bill in which you feel it's wrong. The rule of law is when you feel comfortable suing the government and you actually think you have a chance of winning. That's the rule of law. But if you take it from the government's point of view, when the people can't seek justice through the court system, they will resort to violence. And that happened here when the, one of the first things that the Hong Kong government did after the handover was to request the mainland government to reinterpret the basic law and denied previously uh, uh, individuals who previously had the right of a vote in Hong Kong and suddenly denied that right. And when that happened in 1997, it was said this was for the uh, peace and prosperity of Hong Kong. And then four or five years later, those same individuals who were denied went and firebombed our immigration office and remains a single act of terrorism on the soil of Hong Kong after the handle. We also currently live in, a, in, a, in a, an economy with a ballooning government spending, both on and off balance sheet. And our dirty little secret is that nearly half of Hong Kong's population actually lives in public housing that not only receives vast subsidies, but also, more importantly, are allocated highly inefficient. Basically, once you move into your unit in public housing, you can't move. Your children's schooling might have changed. Your workplace might have changed. But it doesn't matter. It's virtually impossible to move. Holding hostage vast amounts of housing stock that I believe, if liberated, would make Hong Kong's economy even more vibrant than it is today. And also as technicians, they feel they can meddle without consequence, and hence back the implementation of things like a minimum wage law and a competition law, which was traded, I believe, for short-term political support for the government. And as these laws were passed, I despaired for our future, and personally fell deeper and deeper into alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> It is based on my Wikipedia page in Chinese, so <laughs> I don't have an English Wikipedia page yet, but it's right there in my Chinese. So I'm going on there. I got I got drunk on my TV as well. So hi, my name is Andrew and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, from what, actually I actually I actually did share this at one of my meetings. Um, I love Hong Kong and on and what we stand for. I'm proud of the fact that we are the beacon light of freedom. That you all can go home, you all, and go home and tell them how to do it. Because we did it here and it worked. I am proud of the fact that we rely on our liberty and our ingenuity to raise destitute people out of poverty to become an example to the world. I love telling Filipino domestic helpers hanging out in Hong Kong that, uh, hey, did you know that back in the 1960s, it was Hong Kong that exported domestic workers to the Philippines and not the other way around. And they would be shocked. And I would tell Malaysians, for example, that uh, Hong Kong was so poor back in the 60s that uh, my aunts didn't even have money for milk powder, that they simply had to survive for a few days uh, on sugar powder. That was that. But now, I don't know. You know, I, I, uh, I remember during one of my drunk episodes before I hit rock bottom. Peter Wong, Isaiah director, dragged me aside and uh, had a video conversation with me. And he consoled me by saying, perhaps the people have to go through 
experiencing the bad before they can appreciate the good. I said, unless people know they are eating their own dog food, I fear they shall not learn. That's all I'm going to talk about in democracy in my speech. <laughs> he was going to ask me to me. So the future. Yes, financial freedom would probably still be here as the central government needs us to promote the renminbi as a new international currency. Property, property rights in Hong Kong will probably be protected very well in the future because so many corrupt officials park their money here. But as a people, Hong Kong people, there is now an undeniable loss of that unquestionable faith we once had, we once had in the free market system. With an unelected government, together with elected officials who never has to carry the blame for their ideas, there are now a vicious cycle of socialism in place, where the government tries to implement everything the Democrats want, apart from democracy. Which, I guess, also answers that central paradox. Why does a free market think tank exist in the freest economy of the world? I believe we exist as probably the only way to guarantee this miracle we call Hong Kong to exist into the future. And it is our task for us to win this war of ideas in the hearts and minds of the people of Hong Kong. And we have a huge task at hand. In the previous age, socialists were at least honest. They never hide their intentions. But in this post-financial tsunami age, many of these socialists cloak themselves with our free market language and words, but have put in place instead actions of socialism. But no matter how much I despair, and I was actually encouraged, uh, especially on the session about Gary Becker uh, a few days ago at the, uh, at the MPS. Um, I heard a few days ago that uh, when he was uh, uh, asked in the 1970s, you know, price controls was being implemented in the U.S. There were gas ration lines outside petrol stations, etc., etc. Uh, according to Kevin Murphy, Gary Becker went around telling everyone, stay on course, be optimistic, be optimistic. And so, uh, not only do I say we must stay optimistic, uh, I say we must fight on. And to paraphrase Winston Churchill, <laughs> if the freest economy were to last a thousand years, <laughs> men will say this was their finest hour. Thank you, everyone. Whatever diploma you're receiving right now, uh, think before you study. Uh, think before you choose your subjects. Don't do something like economics, like I did, <laughs> because there's an oversupply. <laughs> but uh, their, their general hopelessness. Uh, one of the tragic things is that Hong Kong used to have a very strong apprenticeship culture, uh, but uh, with the uh, with the massive and uh, uh, spending on university places, and also with the imposition of the minimum wage law, uh, we feel that it will be highly detrimental to these marginal university students when they seek um, employment after they graduate. So, yeah. Can you please talk a little about the property prices? I mean, it's obviously not, not oh. an existing solution. Uh, okay. Still uh, abundance of, uh, of, uh, of apartments. Yeah. There's not much land left in Hong Kong. We just cannot allow uh, more that. Okay. It, it, it's, uh, corrupt, uh, corrupt officials are still going to come in Hong Kong and park their their money somewhere. But how, how do we solve this? It's, 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 I don't think it's okay. a self-sustainable situation. Okay. But the, the question is about uh, property prices in Hong Kong, and I guess the subsequent government reaction to it. And this yeah, mentioned... yeah, any reaction it doesn't have to be government. Or, or, okay. What can be done? Sure. 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 Um, the uh, the property prices, the original sin, uh, the original reason why property prices goes up in Hong Kong, and this one I, I, I talked to Bill Stacey and Peter Wong about this one. The original reason, the, the fundamental reason is because we picked our currency. When Margaret Thatcher fell in front of the Great Hall of the People, and when the Hong Kong dollar depreciated in half uh, in two weeks, that was when they came up with the currency peg. Um, and uh, at that moment, well basically we outsourced. Don't, don't think only Americans outsource things to Asia. 
We Asians outsource things to Americans. <laughs> Hong Kong outsources monetary policy to the Americans, to the board of the Federal Reserve. And so of course, when we outsourced it, we had Paul Volcker. <laughs> and now, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked because you know, I, I, because I, I was, I was told this to even to my students, you know, uh, to, to all the interns that go through the Lion Rock Institute. I said, Winston Churchill was right, and I don't even know if I'm quoting him right here. But Winston Churchill once said, Americans always do the right thing after trying everything else. <laughs> And I said that in 2009, when the first round of quantitative easing was, was, uh, was announced, and it's five years now, and they're still doing quantitative easing. So, uh, you know, so if, uh, 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 the holy cow of Hong Kong politics is the peg. Because even the people of Hong Kong, no matter how arrogant we are, not one single individual can come out and say, you know what, I can lead a central bank and decide interest rate for us. Especially knowing that property and the banking sector is so important in Hong Kong, it could be rife with corruption, for example. So uh, we are comfortable of outsourcing it to the Americans. And that is also why even during the depth of our property bubble burst, we never devalued our currency. Would you float yes. it? Sorry? Would you float the currency or? No, I think, I think uh, pegging it to a responsible currency is fine. What would that be? <laughs> well, it used to be the US dollar. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, I want to like, say the thing about supply. Um, because, well, there, there is a law that says we can't reclaim land in Victoria Harbor. Um, there is another law that says we can't touch the country parks uh, that was called the country parks but it was actually zoned by the British to have military significance because when they planned it in the 1970s one of the plans that they thought they could keep the Kowloon in Hong Kong but they would give back the new territories so it was convenient to suddenly zone a, a massive area north of Kowloon to become country parks and subsequently in various other areas too but they sold it to the people of Hong Kong as country parks and then also, um, because of these kind-hearted folks who think that buildings in Hong Kong is too tall, there is now a height imposition, a height limit imposed onto the uh, onto Hong Kong buildings. And then there's there's also uh, you know one of the virtues of having a high population density is you can provide all kinds of services and you can actually run an efficient public transportation system. But then these kind-hearted folks once again successfully lobbied the government and called and told them to lower population density. So you have the most vibrant areas become the old areas, not because just they have, just because they have the incumbency effect, but because they're simply more compact. At least that's what I think. If you go to if you go to the new territories in Hong Kong, especially where they plan all the new towns, one after another are failures in town planning. So uh, you know there are many many examples of how how it is failed. Yes, I agree with this gentleman. Well, the property market of Hong Kong is a reflection of human beings because. Housing is a basic need for people, but right now the situation in Hong Kong is many people, and especially the young generation, they cannot afford to rent a, an apartment or to buy a house. Oh, um, the, uh, yes. Then, yes, and Sorry. then um, even middle class people, they have a lot of burdens just because of the mortgage of the house. They have the property market and the housing, well, it has a lot of, I mean, how to say, to the Hong Kong society. Of course, I mean, I, I will say that uh, we have to uh, remove the high restrictions in buildings. You go to an area called Chen Kuan O, which sounds, you know, Chen Kuan O is actually called Junk Bay. Uh, it's called Junk Bay, I guess, because that's where they call the junk, but also because it was, and it still is, the biggest uh, city dump in the world. And in fact, at one time in the last decade, Chen Kuan O alone had five, I think five, or maybe three, of the ten tallest residential buildings in the world. The, the vision back then was to build high, because obviously if you have no land, you build high, right? Go 3D. But then suddenly they impose these high limits. So you see all these new urban renewal projects um, having these really low height, and it just doesn't make sense. So I agree with you, we have to increase supply, but uh, even the government, with all its money, is no magician. So, uh, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder with the Lion Rock Institute, so that we can fight for the liberation of these, uh, of these land. And on, also, 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 on public housing, on public housing. One of the biggest uh, 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 bugaboos, I guess, for the Lion Rock Institute members is that uh, there is something called rich tenants in the, uh, in the public housing system. Um, their income has far exceeded whatever limits that the government once imposed. But the government only does an income uh, check, like once, every 10 years. And only if they fail once, they start checking it twice. 
And only when, and when they do fail, their rents goes up by 100%. But because they were only charged, say, I don't know, 20% of market rents, so it opened to 40. You only own a thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah, thousand dollars. A pittance, really. And also because Hong Kong's history of being an offshore banking center, Hong Kong people are extremely good at hiding their assets. You have so many public housing tenants right now that have all these assets in southern China. And because a lot of them actually wrote the entire property boom in southern China, a lot of them is actually richer than I am. And yet they get to live in public housing. And then the worst thing was when the British actually came up with public housing system back way back when, they actually built houses of such poor quality that it actually justified the rent. But then, because of social pressure from all these you know, kind-hearted folks, the building quality of public housing kept on increasing. So that by 2006, there was actually a lot and lot of vacant uh, 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 private housing. Because these smaller, especially in the poorer areas, uh, uh, um, housing, uh, couldn't compete on quality and on cost against public housing units. And it's only with this massive rise in income, because we have seen, especially on the, uh, on the retail industry in Hong Kong, with the influx of Chinese tourists, their income has been rising very rapidly in the, five, the last five and six years. So therefore, they've been moving out. In fact, the percentage of individuals living in public housing was over 50% in the year 2000. And it has actually come down to now 45%. And when you actually have that many new household formation uh, in Hong Kong, property prices are bound to rise. Is it not healthy? Yes, we have to increase supply. So, you know, leave your name with us, lend, lend us your support, and we will fight for more housing supply in Hong Kong. And it is a characteristic of the Chinese people, because everywhere they go, they just um, speculate on the property uh, prices. No, I think, I think Chinese, I, think, I, think, I, think, I don't buy that cultural thing. I just think that uh, people of wealth, especially when they come from an area where, where um, one of the, well, the richest men in Hong Kong is Li Ka-shing. And Li Ka-shing <coughs> controls a company called Hutchison Wampoa. And according to Hutchison Wampoa's port operation, China is a very big political risk. So if I was an individual from, a, you know, from an area of big political risk, I want to diversify my assets. And to be honest, I think they are the canary in the mineshaft. If they still come to Hong Kong, that means Hong Kong's property rights are still of a satisfactory level. If they stop coming, then that's it. That's it for Hong Kong. Very good. Thank you so much, Andrew. Oh, also, we, we, are, we are a registered charity in Hong Kong, so if you have an income in Hong Kong, <laughs> you can donate to us to deduct your taxes. <laughs> and let me just uh, thank all of you for, for joining us for a, a really special day. Um, it, it's wonderful to come to Hong Kong and realize that the, the local groups that, that the Atlas gets to um, connect and try to to foster collaboration with are just as exciting and inspiring as, as Lion Rock. So, so thank you again to Lion Rock for hosting everything. Thank you Atlas supporters for making all this possible. Have a good night.